Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, this will be the last uh, lecture on um, Schwarzschild. We have discussed the exterior of spherically symmetric uh, objects, stars or collapsed objects, black holes. And as long as you have vacuum outside of the object, uh, and we have spherical symmetry, then it's always the vacuum as uh, the Schwarzschild space time outside. So this is universal. Now we want to discuss what is inside the star. And of course, this depends very much on what sort of star we have. So there are many, many, many interior metrics which can be matched to the exterior Schwarzschild solution. And I will do only the most simple case, which was actually done by Schwarzschild himself already, namely a star which is static and has constant density. So that's what is called an incompressible fluid. So we will make a particularly simple model of a star, and for this we will then calculate the metric. So this will give us the opportunity to solve Einstein's equation in matter for once. We haven't done this until, uh, until now, right? We have only dealt with a, with a vacuum uh, space-time. So this will be the so-called interior Schwarzschild solution. So what we want to do is we want to find The metric, the space-time, inside a spherically symmetric and static. Of course, you could also discuss pulsating objects or collapsing objects. Yeah? But we don't do this. We consider a static star. Inside a spherically symmetric and static star, which is modeled as an incompressible perfect fluid. So incompressible means con con uh, constant density. Of course, that's not perfectly true for the sun, for instance. Definitely, the sun has a higher density near the center than near the surface. But the variation is actually not too big. So it's a, it's a reasonable approximation for stars like the sun, not so much for really heavy stars. OK, and actually, the solution which we want to derive now uh, was already found by Karl Schwarzschild in 1916 in a follow-up paper to the paper which, uh, in which he derived this vacuum solution. So I told you that he was uh, in World War I, that he was at the Eastern Front when he uh, wrote this first paper on the Schwarzschild solution. He sent the paper to Einstein. Einstein presented it at the Academy, and he was really delighted that somebody was able to, to solve his, uh, his complicated field equation. And then Schwarzschild uh, came back from, from the front very, very ill, he, he suffered from this, this strange um, skin disease uh, on, uh, from which he, he finally died. And uh, in the time when he was in hospital, he wrote the second paper. This was about the interior solution. So this was shortly after he had found the, uh, the exterior solution in the same year. OK, so what do we have to do? So the ansatz will be for the metric. Well, it's here in these two sentences. It's still spherically symmetric and static. And for this metric we had, when we began discussing the Schwarzschild metric, we had derived the general form. So spherically symmetric and static, what does this mean? Symmetric and static. This means that the metric can be brought in the following form. We had, uh, no, we don't, didn't have this. We, just wrote e to the new for the, co for the factor, and because we wanted to have it, um, uh, the, the time coordinate should be time-like. That's the reason why we put a minus sign here. dt squared. dt squared means tensor product of dt with itself. Yeah, that's my, my shorthand notation. And then we had e to the lambda dr squared, and the angular part r squared sine squared theta d phi squared plus the theta squared. So this was a form, and oh, I should write now, they depend, they depend now only on R. Yeah, we began by assuming just spherical symmetry, not requiring the metric to be static, 
then we had a T dependence here. And then we found for the exterior, for the vacuum metric, that this T dependence um, uh, could not be there. This was the Birkhoff theorem. So then we arrived at this form of the metric. Now, for the inside, of course, in principle, we could have a time dependence. There's no general theorem that tells us there's no time dependence. There can be a time dependence. But we want to consider a static star. So we put here only an, an R dependence. So that's the form of the metric we have to deal with. And of course, it should be a solution of Einstein's field equation. And now I emphasize that it doesn't make sense to say a metric satisfies Einstein's field equation unless we have specified what energy momentum tensor we have in mind, right? Any metric is a solution to Einstein's field equation until the energy momentum tensor has been specified, right? So we want to have it, so this should solve Einstein's field equation. And we want to do it for a perfect fluid. And later we will specify that it should be even incompressible. So it's even more special than a perfect fluid in general. So what does this mean? Well, Einstein's field equation, hopefully everybody remembers, was this here. Well, I don't consider a cosmological constant here. Yeah, if we are dealing with local problems, models for stars or things like that, we usually don't, uh, don't take the cosmological constant into account. On the right-hand side, we have Einstein's, cos uh, Einstein's gravitational constant, which is h pi g over c square, if we express it in terms of Newtonian's um, con uh, gravitational constant, and then the energy momentum tensor. And we want to consider a perfect fluid. So we have to specify now for T mu nu the form of a perfect fluid. And this was, I never know where the, where the C, C factors are. Um, mu plus P over C squared. Mu plus P over C squared. U, mu. Uh, maybe I shouldn't use mu because the density will also be called mu. Let me write rho and sigma. And then plus, I think, yes, plus P, zero sigma. So this was a form of a energy momentum tensor of a perfect fluid. We did, I think, two exercises with this, with this form, so hopefully everybody remembers. And uh, you see there are two additional functions. In general, they are functions on the space time, the mu, that's the mass density, and the pressure P, and the four velocity. And here in this case, we want to specify them a little bit further. So the four velocity is u. Let me write it with an upper index. So here we have pulled the index with a metric down. So when we say four velocity, then we usually write it as a vector field with an upper index. And well, uh, now we have a static situation. So u rho is a so it's a flow field of the, of the velocity, of the, of the um, fluid. And uh, we want to consider a static situation. So the individual um, yeah, volume elements of the, of the fluid should not move in our space time. So they should, in, uh, they should not move in space. This means in the space time, they should move along a T line, right? So in space, they should be fixed. This means that in, this coordinate, in these coordinates here, that the U could have only a T coordinate. Right? So it should be proportional to Kronecker delta rho t. And it's a four velocity, so it's normalized to minus c squared. So we can read which factor we must have in front of it. So if I insert this expression into the metric, I am supposed to get minus c squared. And I think I forgot a c squared here, because I want to have this dimensionless. So I think I, I did it this way when we... Uh, I forgot it here also. I always forget the fact that c square. <laughs> I'm sorry for this, but uh, I think that's, that's how, we, how we wrote the, uh, the metric. And um, when we then normalize this to minus c squared, then the factor here obviously must be minus u half, right? Then the u rho is normalized. So by our assumption that the space-time is static and that we have such a perfect fluid, the four velocity is already fixed, right, in terms of one of the metric coefficients. Then we have the mass density mu. So this comes from the assumption that we have a static star. Yeah? That's a 
volume elements move on t-lines. This is the mu. The mass density in general is a function of uh, space and time. And for a static spherically symmetric uh, star, it would still be in general a function of r. But you want to have the fluid incompressible, so we assume that this is a constant. That's our model, and that's what we call an incompressible fluid. So of course you can also derive interior Schwarzschild solutions where uh, the mass density is not constant. But uh, we want to stick to this uh, simplest model. And then we have the pressure. Well, the pressure P, where because of spherical symmetry and the assumption of uh, being static, this can only be a function of R. So this is a function of R. Well, and for this, we do not make any ansatz. We cannot make any ansatz. This uh, mathematical formalism will have to tell us how this function looks like. So this is to be determined. So let's see how many unknown functions have we now in the game. Well, the metric is determined by two functions, nu of r and lambda of r. And then we have also the pressure as an unknown function. We don't know the pressure beforehand. So the field equation. will give us a system of ordinary differential equations where our functions depend only on R because of our symmetry assumptions. Ordinary differential equations for, well, our three unknown functions, nu of R, lambda of r and p of r. So that's quite typical when you solve Einstein's equations in matter. When you solve it in vacuum, the unknown functions are just symmetric coefficients, right? You just get a differential equation for the, um, uh, for the, uh, for the coefficients which enter into the metric. If you solve Einstein's equation in matter, you make a special ansatz for the energy momentum tensor. And in this ansatz, Usually, some functions will enter. So in this case, where well, we make mu into a constant, so that's, uh, 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 that's um, not uh, to be determined as a function. But in this case, we have an additional function, p of r, which is to be determined. And for more complicated models, you would have more functions in the energy momentum tensor. So when you solve Einstein's equation in matter, you will have not only the metric coefficients as unknown functions, but also some additional functions which enter into the energy momentum tensor. And actually, uh, in many cases, this makes the problem not more complicated, it makes the problem more simple. Because if you have more functions to play around with, then it's easier to find solutions in general. Yeah? So actually, solving the vacuum Einstein field equation is the most difficult task. It's more difficult than solving it in matter, as a general rule. It depends on the special situation. But I think as a general rule, one, uh, that's a fair, fair statement. OK, so that's, that's the equations we have to, to discuss. And uh, now we would have to start, well, writing this down. Yeah, for this metric, fortunately, we have already calculated the Ritchie tensor. This was hard work. This, uh, but we have done this, so we can just take them from, the, from one of the, the earlier the earlier lectures. Then you have to calculate the R. That will be not too difficult. And we have to read the components of T mu nu from this special ansatz. And then we can solve Einstein's field equation. But uh, actually, before doing this, before really working with this equation directly, we will do something else. And that's always a good idea if you deal with Einstein's equation in matter. We know that this equation implies this covariant conservation law for the energy momentum tensor. Yeah, remember, so recall the field equation, Einstein's field equation, implies this equation. Oops, del rho sigma is zero. Yeah, we have also done this as in one of the exercises. So if, if you calculate this, this is called a covariant divergence, right? It's built like a divergence. You take the derivative and then you sum over the index. And because it's done with a covariant derivative, one causes a covariant divergence. This follows from this equation, uh, even with a cosmological constant. constant. 
Namely, you apply the covariant derivative, you sum over the uh, respective index, and then you see that this is identically zero. We have done this in one of, the, one of the exercises. So this equation must hold. And this gives us information about, in particular, about the pressure. So if we, if we have a solution of this equation, then this equation must also be satisfied. And it's always a good idea to deal with this equation first, because very often it gives us, in a comparatively easy way, information about functions which otherwise had to be determined in a much more complicated way. So in this case, for this particular example, we will see that this equation determines the pressure already uniquely. So we will get the solution for the pressure just from this equation, and this will make the rest of the calculations then simpler. So let's begin with this. Well, for a perfect fluid, we have evaluated this equation, and we found that this gives the Euler equation. We have dealt with this also in some uh, on several problem sheets, which gives the Euler equation. Well, it's a general relativistic Euler equation, of course. What Euler did in the 18th century was, of course, a non-relativistic equation. It's a generalization into general relativity. And this was the following. It was this factor, which we have here, u plus p over c squared. And then we have a derivative, which tells us how the flow lines uh, behave um, uh, yeah, if I, if I follow, follow them in, in the course of time. And this was plus, I think, gradient. Yes, plus gradient p. g tau, what is the free index? Sigma is the free index plus 1 over c squared. 1 over c squared, yes. u tau, u sigma is 0. So we have worked this out. We considered this first in special relativity, where you had a partial derivative here in usual inertial coordinates, and we derived this equation with partial derivatives here. And uh, then we uh, discussed this in connection with, um, uh, uh, with the rule of minimal coupling, and then this gives us a general relativistic version of the Euler equation. So that's an equation which has to hold if we have a solution of Einstein's equation, yeah? because it follows just mathematically from this equation. And if you look at this carefully, you will find that this already gives us a differential equation for p which can be solved and which uh, determines p. So the first thing we should do in order to work this out is we should write the covariant derivatives as partial derivatives. So hopefully everybody remembers how this was done. So covariant derivative of a vector field is a partial derivative plus uh, Christoffel symbol sigma uh, rho tau u tau. Yeah? If you have a, the derivative acting on a tensor field with upper indices, you get plus terms, positive terms, with uh, the Christoffel symbols. And if you have uh, uh, tensor fields with lower indices, so a covector field or some higher rank tensor with lower indices, then you get minus some gamma terms. This was a, the rule by which covariant derivatives are expressed in terms of partial derivatives. Here you have a scalar function p, and the covariant derivative on a scalar is the same as a partial derivative onto a scalar. And then I have g tau sigma plus 1 over c squared tau u sigma, which is a 0. And, well, uh, we want p depends only on r. So the interesting term is uh, the one where the index tau uh, corresponds to the coordinate r. So this appears if we choose for sigma, uh, for x sigma r. So for this is for an, for an arbitrary coordinate uh, sigma, yeah, which is one of the four coordinates uh, which we are using here. We evaluate this in particular for x sigma equal r, and then we get the following. We get mu plus p over c squared. Well, for here u has only a t component. U rho is proportional to delta rho t. So here I have a t derivative. Yeah, that's the only derivative which occurs. But our fields do not depend on t. So this is zero. Yeah? So this first term is zero. So it comes already the next one. Gamma sigma is now r. Let me write this in this way. And then these summation indices rho and tau are combined with u. And u has only a t coordinate. So here I, has, I only get something is 
is tau and rho is equal to t. So I have this expression. Okay, that's the first term. And here I have, let me begin with a bracket. So I have g sigma is r, and then the other index must also be r because our metric is diagonal, plus one over c squared. U r, u r, but this is zero. This here is zero, right? Because u has only a t coordinate. And here I have, well, p depends only on r, so let me just write p prime. A derivative of p with respect to r. It's its only argument. So now, fortunately, we know from section, this was the first section in the Schwarzschild chapter, so it should be 6.1. We know the Christoffel symbols. I have calculated them <laughs> with, uh, so I took the trouble to, to work uh, all, the, all the gammas out for this metric, so we can just copy it from there. So gamma RTT was C squared half e to the nu minus lambda uh, nu prime. Yeah, nu depends also only on R. So for the derivative, I just write um, nu prime. So we get now nu plus P divided by C squared. So gamma RTT is this c squared half e nu minus lambda nu prime. And u t squared is e to the minus nu. Then we have p prime. And g with the upper indices rr is the inverse of g with the lower indices rr. Right? Our metric is diagonal. So calculating the inverse is very simple. I just invert the diagonal elements. Yeah, so this is 1 over g rr with lower indices. So it's e to the minus lambda. And this is 0. And you see this gives us a very nice equation for p, a differential equation for p. So first of all, e to the nu and e to the minus nu kill each other. And then I can divide by e to the minus lambda. So all the exponential functions drop out. And what I have here should be a derivative. Let me see. Have I done this? No, I think I have to multiply with e to the what? e to the nu? Let me see. e to the nu. Yeah, I think this works. So then I get oh, e to the nu half. e to the nu half, I think. So let me, let me write again what we get then. Then we see if we have done everything correct. So this gives mu c squared half plus p half u prime e to the nu half. And here I get p prime e to the nu half is 0. Is this a derivative? I hope so. I think this is mu c squared plus p times e to the nu half, derivative of the whole thing. Is this true? If I use the product rule, if I just take the derivative of the second factor, I get this here, e to the nu half, and then nu prime is a factor one half. And if I take the derivative of this and use as mu is constant, we assume that mu is constant. Yeah? So only this term must be differentiated, so we get p prime e to the nu half. So this is zero. And that's, of course, very easy. That can be very easily integrated. So we get mu c squared plus p e to the new half must be a constant. Do I want to call it b? I think I want to call it b, yes. So that's an integration constant. So we can solve for p if we like to do so. So p is b e to the minus new half and then minus u c squared. Where's the r dependence? Let me indicate the r dependence. p is a function of r u is a function of r, and everything else is constant, okay? So that's our first result. We have found the pressure. We have expressed the pressure in terms of one of the metric functions and constant. So I will try not to erase this because we need this result later. So now we solve Einstein's field equation. So now we work with this equation here. So 
For this, we need all non-zero components of the left-hand side, and we have to equate them to the non-zero components of the right-hand side. So fortunately, we have calculated the uh, rigid tensor already. So the non-vanishing non -vanishing components are mu nu. Are, and again, we can just look them up from what we have calculated, I think, two weeks ago or so. So all the non-diagonal elements are zero. So I only write the diagonal elements, which we had found. So RTT was non-zero. This was C squared e to the nu minus lambda. New double prime half plus new prime squared over 4 minus lambda prime new prime 4 over 4 plus new prime over r. This was RTT. And we have r, r, r. This was minus new prime half minus 1 over 4 u prime squared plus lambda prime u prime over 4 plus lambda prime over r. And the other two diagonal elements were closely related. r theta theta is almost the same thing as r phi phi. They just differ by sine squared of theta. And this is 1 minus e to the minus lambda minus r half e to the minus lambda u prime minus lambda prime. So that's what we have calculated a while ago. So this can be inserted into Einstein's field equation. And then we need also the scalar curvature. This we haven't calculated yet, so we have to do it now. So we have to calculate R is what? So that's a new calculation. This was just copied from earlier results. So how was this defined? Just to remind you, this was in general defined in this way. And now here, fortunately, we have only diagonal elements. Both the Ritchie tensor and the metric are diagonal. So we have only the diagonal terms, RTT, GTT, plus RRR, GRR, and then comes the first, first the term, R theta theta, G theta theta. Uh, OK, let me write all of them, plus R phi phi, G phi phi. So these are the, the metric coefficients with upper indices. Of course, I can express them by the ones with lower indices. G with upper indices, TT is just the inverse of G with lower indices. So they are defined by uh, inverting the matrix, right? And the diagonal matrix is easily inverted in this way. And if you look at these two terms, you see that they are the same. Both of them are the same because the components of the Ricci tensor differ just by a factor sine squared theta, and also the components of the metric differ just by a factor sine squared theta. So this goes away. So I get just two times r theta theta over g theta theta. OK, and that's what we have to insert. So that becomes a little bit long, but in the end, we can combine many terms. So let me write this out. So 1 over gtt is 1 over c squared. and gtt is e to the nu, so if I take the inverse, I get e to the minus nu, right? And then rtt. What is rtt? We have calculated it up there. So that's c squared e to the nu minus lambda, nu double prime half plus nu prime squared over 4 minus lambda prime nu prime over 4 plus nu prime over r. So that's 
Uh, I think this bracket was not necessary. Uh, I think I can spare this bracket. So that's the first term, right? Then comes the second term. Is this really true? So if I had a term outside of the bracket, I know this comes later. Okay, it's all right. So then the next one, plus one over GRR. GRR is e to the lambda, so it's in the denominator, so I get e to the minus lambda. And then RRR. RRR is minus mu double prime half, minus mu prime squared over four, plus lambda prime mu prime over four, plus lambda prime over r. So that's the second term. And then the last one is two times one over g theta theta. This is r squared. g theta theta, as you can read from the metric, read from the metric is uh, one over r squared. And r theta theta is here. One minus e to the minus lambda minus r half e to the minus lambda, u prime minus lambda prime. Okay, looks awful, but if you look carefully, you see that it's not that bad. Actually, if you multiply this out, this goes away, and the new also goes away, right? So you have e to the minus lambda in front of the bracket, and here also. So we can combine the two terms. And now let's see. I have plus new double prime half minus new double prime half, so they kill each other. I have new prime squared over four with a plus and here with a minus, so they kill each other. Here again I have the same term, once with a plus and once with a minus, and these two, oh, what about the signs? Is this really true? Do I have lambda prime plus new prime? Uh, ah, there, ah, there comes another term. Okay, I think it's true. So let me write it as, as in the same order as I appear. So this is this here and this here. Lambda prime over r. Here also I get an e to the minus lambda. This comes with minus 2 over r squared. And here I get an e to the minus lambda. This comes with 1 over r times this and with a minus sign. It's minus mu prime over r plus lambda prime over r. And then I have this term here. This is plus 2 over r squared. And uh, I think that's not true. That's a factor 2 in the wrong place. So what have I done here? Have I mixed up a sign? I think this is all wrong. I'm sorry. I think I forgot a sign. What is GTT? What is GTT? I've written it as e to the minus nu over c squared, but that's not true. It comes with a minus sign. <laughs> yeah? GTT is negative. And this changes everything. Sorry for this. Oh. So oh, let me take this away. This was completely wrong. So what I actually get is e to the minus lambda. So these terms do not go away. So that's minus your double prime. Yeah? It comes twice with a factor one half. Then I have minus mu prime squared over two. Then I have minus lambda prime nu prime over 2. And then I have plus lambda prime minus nu prime over r. So these are the first two terms. And then from this here, I get minus 2 over r squared. From this, I get minus nu prime minus lambda prime over r. And then this term plus 2 over r squared. Yeah, that looks better. So let me see. Mm, the lum, 
No, this term comes just twice, right? Yeah, this comes just twice. And I think that's it. Yeah. OK, so that's R. And now we have to calculate the, uh, the left-hand side of the field equation. And I think I don't have to take you through the details of the expression. So I calculate now RTT minus R half GTT and so on. Yeah? So you see you get similar terms. And now, actually, a lot of terms uh, cancel. And I think I just write the left-hand side, uh, so the final result for the left-hand side. So I get RTT minus R half GTT. Yeah, it's clear what we have to do. RTT is here, R is here, and GTT is uh, minus C squared e to the minus nu. So it's easy to calculate this. And I just write the result. This gives, oops, C squared e to the nu, e to the minus lambda, lambda prime over r, minus 1 over r squared, plus 1 over r squared. That's the first term. And we have r, r, r nonsense, minus r half. GRR plus this new prime over R plus 1 over R squared minus e to the lambda over R squared. And the last one is R theta theta minus R half G phi phi, which is the same thing as 1 over sine square of theta r phi phi minus r half g phi phi. And this is actually what? This is r squared e to the minus lambda u prime minus lambda prime over 2r plus nu double prime over 2r plus nu prime squared over 4 minus lambda prime nu prime over 4. So that's the left-hand side of the field equation. Now we calculate the right-hand side, which is much easier. And then we equate the two things. So this was the left-hand side of the field equation. So right-hand side of the field equation involves the components of the energy momentum tensor. It's just written still down there. Oops. So I look in this line at the bottom there, and I insert for rho and sigma t. And I get mu plus p over c squared u t u t plus p g t t. Oops. This is what? This is mu plus p over c squared. Well, u is a lower index, is the same as g t t u t with an upper index. OK? So u is only a t component. In general, here we would have a sum over all four indices. But the only component of u which is non-zero is a t component. So we have just this here, plus p g t t. And this is what? Mu plus p over c squared. GTT ut. GTT was minus, where well, the minus squared uh, gives a plus. And then we have e to the 2 nu over c squared. There's no bracket, by the way. And ut squared was e to the minus nu. ut was e to the minus nu half. And here you have plus p. GTT, that is minus C squared e to the nu. Well, the whole thing is what? Well, the first term, if I multiply it out, is mu e to the plus nu over C squared. And the other two terms, you see, they cancel each other. So 
Uh, what about the seas? Oh, I have again a problem with the sea. Uh, ah, what, did, what have I done here? No, this is nonsense. That's a c to the 4 here. Look, gtt is c squared times e to the nu. And if I square this, I get c to the 4, e to the 2 nu. Sorry, this, that's the correct version. And now hopefully the unpleasant terms uh, go away. No, this is only plus e to the, e to the nu because these two terms compensate each other. And then I have here c squared in the numerator. Here also a p, a p, e to the nu, e to the nu. So they kill each other and that's it. So that's t, t, t. What about the e to the nu? Is this true? Let me see. Uh, boop, boop, boop. Yeah, I think it is true. OK, <laughs> good. <laughs> so what about TRR? TRR is mu plus C squared UR UR plus P GRR. Now U has only a T component. And that's still true if I pull the indices. So this is 0, right? Because the metric is diagonal. So also the, the U with lower indices has only a T component. So I'm left only with the second term, P times GRR. That's P times E to the lambda. And T theta theta, which is actually the same as T phi phi over sine squared theta, this is mu plus p over c squared u theta u theta plus p g theta theta. This is 0 because u has only um, a, t, a t component. And g theta theta is r squared. So that's p times r squared. And that's it. These are the components of the energy momentum tensor. And now we can write down the non-vanishing components of Einstein's field equation. So I haven't written the non-diagonal elements because they are zero on both sides, right? So R we calculated as a, the Ricci tensor. The Ricci tensor for this metric has no off-diagonal elements. So whenever here the two indices are different, we get a zero. And the same is true for the energy momentum tensor because here I have, well, I should point to this expression down there. So you see uh, here, this is symmetric and this is symmetric. And actually, it's diagonal. This has only a TT component, and this has only diagonal components. So all the off-diagonal elements are zero. So what is now the system of equations we have to solve? You get three equations, right? A TT component, a, a, yeah, TT component, RR component, and theta theta component. The phi phi component gives the same equation, and the other ones are zero. They are identically satisfied. So the field equation reduces to three ordinary differential equations. So the field equation yields what? Yields three components. Three non-trivial scalar, equ scalar equations. Oh, let's call them F1, F2, F3, F for field equation. So this here must be the same as this here up to this uh, uh, dimensional factor, up to the gravitational constant. So RTT minus R half GTT is C squared e to the nu, e to the minus lambda, lambda prime over R minus 1 over R squared, plus 1 over r squared. And on the right-hand side, I have 8 pi g over c squared, Einstein's gravitational constant, times t, t, t. Where is t, t, t? Here. Mu c to the 4 times e to the nu. And now let's see. Yes, uh, fortunately, I have c squared on both sides. Uh, Wait a minute. No, sorry. This is wrong. Einstein's uh, gravitational constant is 8 pg over c to the 4. Sorry. And here I have 
c to the 4. So I get only, uh, if I divide by c squared, I still have a square in the denominator. And e to the new, this cancels. Oops, and here. So that's the first component. And the second? That's the RR component. So this gives new prime over R plus 1 over R squared minus e to the lambda over R squared. And on the right-hand side, I have TRR, which is P times e to the lambda. Fairly harmless. And F3 is, uh, actually I will not use it, but for, this, for the sake of completeness, let me also write it. So this is this expression here, mu prime minus lambda prime over 2r, plus mu double prime over 2r, plus mu prime squared over 4, minus lambda prime mu prime over 4. And this should be equal to PR squared. Well, we can divide by R squared. So these are the three equations we have to solve. So you see it's a system of ordinary differential equations. The unknown functions depend only on R. And uh, yeah, the unknown functions are still nu and lambda. P is already known. P is down there. And now have a look at this, uh, what's the most intelligent way to solve it. Well, if you look carefully, you will see that the first equation involves only lambda, whereas this here involves lambda and nu. So it's certainly a good, and this is higher orders, it's even more complicated. So it's certainly a good idea to start with this one, which involves only lambda, yeah? So we solve F1, which is actually pretty simple. So let me see. I think I multiplied this R squared, that's convenient. So then I get e to the minus lambda, lambda prime r, minus e to the minus lambda. I've multiplied with r squared, so this is gone, and plus 1. And on the right-hand side, I have 8 pi g over c squared, mu r squared. Well, if you look careful, carefully, you see that you can integrate this very easily. So what we have here is minus e to the minus lambda r differentiated, and the one is, of course, r differentiated. So what we have on the right-hand side is the derivative of this. Yeah? If you take the derivative of this with the product rule, differentiate the exponential function, you get this term. Differentiate the r, you get this term. And differentiate this r, you get the one. Yeah? So that's the same thing. And on the right-hand side, well, that's also easy to write this as a derivative. So r squared is a derivative of what? r squared is a derivative of r cubed over 3, if I'm not very much mistaken, right? So I can write this in this way. And then I can integrate the whole thing. Yeah? So I write everything to the left-hand side, say, minus e to the minus lambda r plus r minus 8 pi g over c squared u r cubed over 3 is a constant. Uh, let's call this constant c. We had already b. Now let's call this c. And this would give us the unknown function lambda. Can we say something about the c? Well, we want to describe a star which should have a regular center. Yeah, we don't want to have singularities inside the star. The star should be regular everywhere, in particular at the center. Now look at the left-hand side when we go to the center to r equals 0. Then, where well, this goes to zero, this goes to zero, and this goes also to zero unless this becomes infinite. That's a function of r, right? But we don't want to have singularities. We don't want to have any metric coefficient to become infinite inside the star. So this should also stay finite, and then the left-hand side would become zero at the center. So c must be zero. Yeah? So we want to have, to have a regular center. Our star should not have singularities. This means, in particular, that e to the minus lambda at 0 is finite. Yeah? 
And this implies that c must be 0. Otherwise, it doesn't work if I go to r equals 0. So this equation simplifies. So we can, uh, well, I'll write it again, e to the minus lambda r plus r minus 8 pi g c squared mu r3 cubed is 0. And here we can divide by r and then solve for e to the minus lambda, and we have found our second metric coefficient. I don't want to erase this. I need the p later. So I should stop here. So that's what Schwarzschild did in hospital, right? I'm, I'm not sure if this is a, a, good, a good therapy to, to work on things like that if you are, you are very ill. So I divide by r and solve for e to the minus lambda. So then I get what? I get e to the minus lambda. So that's now on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, I have 1 minus 8 pi g over c squared mu r squared over 3. I have divided by r. And that's our solution for the metric function lambda. So we have determined p in terms of, uh, of nu, and we have determined lambda. So what is left is we have to determine nu. And now, of course, it's a good idea to use equation f2, because now we know lambda and we know p. So f2 will become a function for, uh, an equation for nu alone. So let me write it again. That's nu prime over r plus 1 over r squared. r squared minus, and I think here I can, or let me put this on the other side and write an e to the lambda in front of the brackets, and I have p plus 1 over r squared. OK, that's it. And we know, well, we know e to the minus lambda, so it's convenient to write this on the other side. And I have e to the minus lambda, u prime over r plus 1 over r squared. And this is p plus 1 over r squared. We know this in terms of nu, and we know this. And we insert these expressions. So e to the minus lambda is this here. 1 minus 8 pi g over c squared, u r squared over 3, times nu prime over r, plus 1 over r squared. And we know p. p is there. b e to the minus nu half minus mu c squared, plus 1 over r squared. OK, what next? I think I leave this term as it is. I just copy it. But I multiply the second out. c squared, this is mu r squared over 3 times nu prime over r. And I multiply this out. So I get minus nu prime over r plus 1 over r squared. And here I have b e to the minus nu half. What have I done here? Wait a minute. No, I made nonsense. I, I took this factor times this here. Sorry. Oops. So the first is correct, but then I've written nonsense. 
And now I have this to multiply with this bracket, right? This gives something different. Uh, everything is wet. So what do I get? I get this here, plus 1 over r squared. And then these two things multiplied. This is 8 pi g over c squared u over 3. And the two factors r squared cancel. And here I have b e to the minus mu half minus mu c squared plus 1 over r squared. OK, this should be, yes, very good. 1 over r squared, 1 over r squared. And uh, hmm. uh, did I forget a factor 8 pi g over c squared? Let me see. Uh, of course, I forgot. Ah, look, what have I written here? Here, here I did it correctly. But here I've written the left-hand side of the field equation, but on the right-hand side I've just written the energy momentum tensor without this factor, without the gravitational constant, right? So I forgot here 8 pi g over c to the 4, and here also 8 pi g over c to the 4. That's Einstein's gravitational constant. So f1 was OK, so there's nothing wrong with this. But here, we have another factor. Why do we have this factor? It comes with a p. Oh, my goodness. Sorry. I have to erase this. So p comes with a 8 pi g over c squared. Uh, and then I have minus 1 over, no, plus 1 over r squared. This was OK. Oh, very bad. So the p is multiplied with 8 pi g over c to the 4. So yeah, I have to multiply this. So 1 over r squared is OK. And then I have what? 8 pi g over c to the 4. And for p, I insert this expression there. b e to the minus mu half minus mu c squared. And then this term is also wrong. So I get oops, 1 over r squared, which goes away. That was correct. And then I get these two terms, plus 8 pi g over c to the 4, b e to the minus new half. And here I have minus 8 pi g u over c squared. And that's better, because these two terms can be combined. So I leave this as it was, 1 minus 8 pi g c squared mu r squared over 3, mu prime over r. And I combine these two terms. So then I get minus 1 third plus 1. So this gives plus 2 third. 8 pi g u over c squared. And on the right hand side I have 8 pi g over c4 b e to the minus new half. OK, and now you stand back and look at this for a couple of hours and see if you can integrate this. But I think just by looking at it, you won't see it. So you have to play around with the expressions a little bit. And then you will see that it actually works. You can integrate this. And what we have to do is we have to multiply this with e to the new half times r. Uh, divided by the square root of 1 minus 8 pi g over c squared u r squared z 
and the whole thing cubed. Let me do this. So then I get e to the new half. The r goes away. So I have only a new prime. This gives 1 minus 3 half. So I get a root in the denominator. So I get a root 1 minus 8 pi g c squared u r squared over 3. That's the first term. The second term. is 2 third a pi g mu over c squared e to the new half times r and then square root 1 minus a pi g c squared mu r squared over 3 cubed. Oh, I was a little bit too generous with the space. I have to squeeze this a little bit. I have here 8 pi g b e to the new half r divided by c to the 4 square root 1 minus 8 pi g c squared u r squared over 3 cubed. And if we have done everything correct, we can integrate both sides. My claim is that the first term, the first two terms, uh, e to the new half, what about the r? Uh, yeah, I think this could work. Right side is I'm sorry? Right side is correct. Have I made a mistake? Mm -hmm. 8 pi g over c4. Oh, the, oh, the, the exponent, oh, thank you. Yes, this is nonsense. No correct? I hope so. Yeah, these two, these two things kill each other, right? So on the left-hand side, I hope I have a pi g over c squared mu r squared. It's the derivative of this. Let me check. Uh, or rather, two times this, two times this. If I take the derivative of the numerator, then I get the first term, right? And if I leave the denominator as it is. And if I leave the numerator as it is, I get 2 times e to the new half. And then I have to differentiate the square root. The square root gives 1 over the square root cubed. And they have two minus signs, one from differentiating something which is in the denominator and this minus sign, so the sign remains plus. And from the inner derivative, I get a 2, which kills the 2 from the, uh, differentiating the, the square root. And then I get 8 pi g mu over c squared times 3, exactly this factor here. So this is the derivative of the right-hand side. And what do we have on the ref, on the, uh, sorry, oh, this was the left-hand side. What do we have on the right-hand side? On the right-hand side, we have also a derivative, something with... Uh, 1 minus 8 pi g over c squared u r squared over 3 in the denominator. But let's see what is in the numerator. In the numerator, if I differentiate this, I get 8 pi g over c squared. 8 pi g over c squared. But here I have a c to the 4, so c squared will be left. And, um, and also I have no mu. So I also need a mu, so I have to divide by mu. And then I have from, I have b, right? Is that true? Just b or anything else. I think just b. Uh, if I differentiate this, yes, I get everything else. I get everything else. Let me check. Oops. To the new. Very 
but I think I forgot a three. Do we? Ah, ah, yes, this three. This three. I need a three here. Yeah. If I differentiate this here, I get a one over three. This must be killed by this factor three. Three b. So yes, I think the otherwise it's correct. So if you differentiate these expressions on either side. And if we have done everything correct, then we should get these expressions. And this can be integrated, right? So we get 2 e to the new half divided by root 1 minus 8 pi g over c squared mu r squared over 3 is 3b over c squared mu square root of the same expression c squared u r squared over 3, plus a constant, and we call it minus d. I think I want to call it minus d, yes. So this can, of course, be solved for e to the new half easily. So e to the new half, I have a factor 2 here, 3b over 2c squared mu, and then minus, and let me call it 2d. Let me call it 2d, so I have just a d here. I can give any name to the integration constant I like, right? Let me call it 2d times the root 8 pi g c squared u r squared over 3. And that's the solution. Now we are done. So we have determined all unknown functions, right? We had three unknown functions, nu, lambda, and p, and we have expressed all of them. The solution involves integration, where they involve three constants. The constant mu, from which we started with, that's the constant density which we put into the game. Then the d and the b. So we have three constants. Well, is this a surprise that the solution will involve constants which are undetermined until now? No, of course not. We must have some free constants in order to match this to an exterior solution of the appropriate total mass, right? And that's what we will do now in order to see how these constants, b, d, and also the mu, are related to yeah, the parameters in the, in the exterior solution. So the exterior solution is characterized by the total mass, which enters into the Schwarzschild radius, and of course also the radius of the star, which I denoted R star. Yeah? The radius of the star, of course, will also characterize the solution. So if you want to link this to the metric in the exterior space, we have to find how b, d, and mu are related to the total mass and to the star of the, uh, of the to the radius of the star. But this would be not not very difficult. And if we have done this, then we can discuss the result. And actually, the result will be quite interesting. Namely, uh, we can then discuss if it is actually possible to have such a star matched to the vacuum exterior at any radius r star we like, or if the possible radius of the star is limited in a certain way. Well, we would expect, of course, that it must be limited by the Schwarzschild radius. If we try to do it at a smaller radius than the Schwarzschild radius, it's clear that we must get nonsense. But actually, even in addition, we will get a restriction, and that's somewhat, um, somewhat surprising and quite interesting. So that's the so-called Buchdahl limit, which we will derive now in a minute. So that is a general solution to the differential equation. Oh, I forgot to mention we have a third equation. I just erased it. This was F3. But you can check that F3 is now automatically satisfied. So it gives no additional information. I should have mentioned so F3 gives no additional information. So we have really found the general solution to our system of differential equations under the assumptions we put into it. Okay, so what are the matching conditions? Uh, maybe you remember from electrodynamics that you can derive matching conditions, jump conditions, they are sometimes called, or junction conditions, from, from Maxwell's equations, from the differential equations. So the differential equations tell you which components of the fields E, D, B, and H 
can have a certain jump at a surface. And in general relativity, it's exactly the same thing. Einstein's equations tell you quite generally what sort of jumps are possible. But I will not derive the general junction conditions here. For the problem at hand, actually it's fairly easy to, yeah, to give a convincing physical argument what the matching conditions should be. What you will use is that the metric should be continuous. And that's obviously a necessary condition. Because if the metric would have a jump at the surface of the star, then the Christoffel symbols would have Dirac delta-like singularities, right? So if you take the derivative of a discontinuity, you get a Dirac delta. But what would happen to a freely falling particle as it passes through such a point? It would get a kick. It would jump from one point to the other. And of course, this doesn't happen at the surface of a star, right? So the metric must be continuous. So junction conditions at the surface of the star and that's the radius which I denote in this way yeah, with an index star. That's the radius of the star. The physical radius of the star and an obvious condition is that the metric coefficients must be continuous there, because otherwise the geodesics would jump if they pass through this surface. So the first condition would be that e to the nu is continuous. And the second condition is that e to the lambda is continuous. And then the third one, that's also physically easy, easily understood, the, first, the third one involves the pressure. What do you think? What should the pressure do at the surface of the star? Any condition on the pressure? Think physically. What would the pressure to have to do at the surface of a star, which is static, it doesn't move, doesn't oscillate, doesn't expand or construct, it is static. So what must the pressure do at the surface? Constant, even more than that, even more, yeah, it must be constant on the surface, that's true, but even more than that, the constant must have, to part have a particular value. <laughs> zero. zero, yeah. If it's non-zero, the star would expand, right? There's nothing, uh, nothing putting pressure from the outside, outside there's vacuum. But if a little bit under the surface, the pressure would be different from zero, then the star would expand. Yeah, the pressure would try to, to push the volume element outwards. So, at this, so, here at r equal r star, the pressure must be zero. And this gives us three conditions. So we can evaluate them now. So where is e to the nu? Well, if e to the nu is continuous, also e to the nu half is continuous. And if lambda is continuous, also e to the minus lambda is continuous. So that's the way in which I've written the uh, symmetric coefficients. So if, if I come from the inside, then I get 3b over 2c squared mu to c squared mu minus d root 1 minus 8pg over c squared mu, and now r star squared. Yeah, I'm now at the surface of the star, r star squared over 3. So that's e to the new half if I come from the inside. Outside, I have the Schwarzschild solution, the vacuum Schwarzschild solution. And what is e to the new half there? It is the square root of 1 minus 2mg over c squared r star, right? That's the metric coefficient in the Schwarzschild space-time. 2mg over c squared is the Schwarzschild radius rs. So you may abbreviate this if you like to do so. So what about uh, the other coefficient? e to the minus lambda is here. That's 1 minus uh, 8 pi g over c squared. 8 pi g over c squared, mu over 3 r star squared. That's e to the minus lambda if I come from the inside. And e to the minus lambda if I come from the outside is 1 minus 2 mg over c squared r star. If you remember the Schwarzschild metric. That's what's under the dr squared yeah, in the Schwarzschild metric. And p equals 0, there's p. p equals 0 means that b e to the minus nu half, ah, so e to the, mi <laughs> e to the minus nu half, 
uh, is, okay, I'll write it. E to the minus mu half of R star, if I insert this later, minus mu C squared must be zero. So I think to begin with, give, let's give name to these equations. So these are the junction conditions, J1, J2, J3. Well, G2 is very simple. G2 is very simple. And this gives something which maybe does not come as a surprise to you, but actually it should come as a surprise. Well, if I divide by 2mg over c squared, I get 4 over 3 pi r star squared and another one, so I get r star cubed, and this is m. Uh, sorry, times mu, this is m. So let's see what is this. Mu was the mass density of the star. This, well, this looks familiar, right? That's the volume of a sphere. The volume of a sphere of radius r star. Mass density times volume is a total mass, yeah, obviously. Quite trivial, right? No, absolutely not trivial. Because, first of all, this m was defined asymptotically. We got it from the Newtonian limit. Not from integrating over the body. We got it from the field at infinity, or at large radii. And that this asymptotically defined mass has something to do with an integral over mu is absolutely not clear, for, uh, not clear from the beginning. Second thing, we are in a curved, on a curved manifold. So the volume really measured with a metric will not be this object, which is just the volume measured with the ordinary Euclidean metric if this is a Euclidean radius. You would expect some, something else, something which involves the metric coefficients. But no, nonetheless, this quite, uh, quite elementary formula does hold. So actually, it should come as a big surprise that this equation does hold. So you can interpret the mu in the way that you say you divide the total mass, which is measured asymptotically, by the volume of the sphere, which is measured just with the Euclidean with the Euclidean formula. So that's the relation between mu and m. So we can express mu in terms of m and r star if we like to do so. So what about expressing b and d in terms of the, uh, uh, of the uh, um, uh, constants m and r star? So we insert this result into j1 and j2. And let's see what we get. Oops. So we get uh, from the first equation 3b over 2c squared mu minus d square root. And now I insert this expression. So this here, that's what I have under the square root. It's the same as this here. So this is 1 minus 2mg over c star, c square r star. And on the right hand side, I have this root 1 minus. 2mg over c squared r star. So that's j1. And j2? j2 is what? Well, I multiply with e to the new half. Then I get b is minus mu c squared times e to the plus new half. And this I can read from there. So this is what? Uh, this is 3d over 2c squared mu, 2c squared mu minus d. And so again, the square root, which is the same square root as we have here. So I again write it as 2mg c squared r star, and the bracket is closed. OK, from these, I have two equations for the two unknown constants b and d, and this can be solved. Let me see how I do this in the most intelligent way. So from the first equation, uh, how do I do this? Yeah, I think the first equation is 3b over 2c squared mu times root 1 minus 2mg over c squared r star, and now 1 plus d. The other equation, well, I get here b minus 3 half b. No, b plus, oh, that looks funny. 
e plus 3 half b, that would five half be 5 half. Hmm. I think I made a mistake. Got minus three half minus. No, there's a sign mistake. But where's the sign mistake? Three half. Does anybody see a sign mistake? So I, I write the correct equation. So what I want to get from the second equation is three b over two c squared mu is. 3b, this root, but I think I don't. So this is, this is the first equation, yes, yeah, this is the first equation and the second equation, and that's again the first equation and the second equation. That's what I want to get, but I don't get this here. So I get this with a 3, I would have to multiply, no, this is absolutely not the same thing. So, sorry, obviously I made again a calculational mistake. Does anybody see what, what's wrong? Ah, oh, I see it, I forgot this term, <laughs> I forgot this term. Look, I just inserted, no. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> no, no, I put this to the other side and I made a sign mistake here. Yeah, there was a minus sign, I put it to the other side and then it becomes plus. <laughs> Let's see if this works. Maybe this, this could, could be better. So now I get one minus three half, so I get one half. And on the other side I get, I get d times mu c squared, <coughs> mu c squared. I would get this here. Oh, that's also wrong. Ah, oh, my goodness, that's awful. No, it's also wrong. Uh, one half. No, I think this works. This works. This works. Three B. Yes. Yes. I can just multiply both sides with this factor three, <laughs> and then I can subtract these two things. So I subtract the two equations, and then I get 1 plus d minus 2d. That's minus 2d. Yes, very good. It works out. And the square root. Well, the square root is, of course, not 0. We are outside of the Schwarzschild radius. We are not uh, at the Schwarzschild radius. So this implies d must be 1 half. So we have found our second constant, and then this gives us a third constant. So we can use this equation, for instance, then we get d is 2 c squared mu times d, which is 1 half, times the square root 1 minus mg r squared r star. Very good. So we have determined all constants. And now comes the interesting part. So this was hard work, not very pleasant work, but now comes something interesting. We have determined now all constants and all, uh, well, first we have solved the equations, then we have determined all constants, so we have found the solution. But now there's one thing we haven't cared about yet. We haven't uh, cared about the fact that the pressure must be positive, yeah? We wouldn't say that the solution with a negative pressure is physically reasonable. And we also wouldn't say that the solution is reasonable if the pressure would have a zero somewhere. But if you look at the formula for the pressure, the formula for the pressure has actually a zero in the, uh, something in the denominator which could become zero. And let's, uh, let's try to, to work this out now. So is the pressure 
everywhere finite. And positive. And in order to check this, we calculate P of zero. In particular, we want to have the pressure at the origin uh, uh, positive and, um, uh, and uh, finite. So at zero, we get B e to the minus u half of zero minus mu c squared. And let's see what this is. We have determined B. B is this here. B is c squared mu root 1 minus 2mg over c squared r star. And e to the minus nu half, hopefully we have it still on the board. Yes, here, e to the minus. Oh, I should have inserted this first. Sorry, I should have inserted this first. e to the minus nu half is, yeah, this was too early. This was too early, sorry. Because this also brings a b. So what is e to the minus nu at r equals 0? So it's the inverse of this here. So it is b divided by 3b over 2c squared mu minus d. And we are at r equals 0, so the square root gives a 1 minus uc squared. And if I write this on 1, well, first of all, I multiply this with 2c squared mu, 2c squared mu times b over 3b minus 2c squared mu d minus mu c squared. And now I put it on a common denominator, 3b minus 2c squared mu d. And here I have 2c squared mu d, then minus 3, so I get a minus 1 here, minus 1, plus 2c to the 4 mu squared d. And now I can insert the constants. So I get minus c squared mu b. Where's b? b is here. b is c squared mu root 1 minus 2gm over c squared r star at this term. d is 1 half, so I get just c squared mu divided by 3 times b, 3c squared mu root 1 minus 2mg over c squared r star. d is 1 half, so I get minus c squared mu. Okay, we can write this a little bit nicer. I think we can divide by c squared mu and write c squared mu in front of the whole thing. Then I get 1 minus square root 1 minus 2gm over c squared r star. And in the denominator I get 3 square root 1 minus 2gm over c squared r star minus 1. And now look. Well, just to remind you, this is a Schwarzschild radius. Yeah? So maybe we could write it in this way. Maybe that's more suggestive. 1 minus root 1 minus rs over r star. rs is a Schwarzschild radius. That's the way how it was defined. And here I have 3, 1 minus rs over r star minus 1. Now you see. Obviously, it doesn't work if the star is smaller than the Schwarzschild radius. Yeah? If this is bigger than Rs, then I have something negative under the square root and everything is awfully bad. Yeah? But that, that doesn't come as a surprise. We know that a stable star cannot have a radius smaller than the Schwarzschild radius because then it has fallen through the horizon and then it has to collapse. We know this. But this term here, this becomes negative already at a bigger value. Yeah? This becomes bigger uh, this becomes uh, negative already at a, at a bigger value than r star. 
So what we find, I, I solve this in a minute, what we find is that actually already for some radii bigger than the Schwarzschild radius, the star cannot persist. And that's the so-called Huchtal limit, named after the gentleman who calculated this first, Hans Buchtal, German relativist who lived in Australia for many years, died recently at very, very old age. And he did this, I think, in the 1950s. He found this limit under much more general conditions than we used it here. We have just derived it for stars with constant density. It works for much more general uh, matter models. So we have just verified it for incompressible stars. So this will be the last thing. Let me, give me just one minute. It's just one line to derive this Buchta limit. So what do we have to calculate? We have to see that the denominator is bigger than zero. So, so P of Z zero is positive if the following holds. If three square root one minus Rs over R star is bigger than one, right? That's a condition. Now let's solve this. Well, I can square this, of course. That's the easiest way to solve for R star. So this must be bigger than 1. And then I have 9 minus 1 is 8. 8 is bigger than 9 Rs over R star. So we get R star must be bigger than 8. No, the other way around, 9 over 8. 9 over 8 Rs, and that's the famous Buchta limit. So if, if you compress a star already at a value which is bigger than Rs, which is not much bigger, but a little bit bigger, already then it will no longer work. The star can no longer persist. It would develop yeah, a negative pressure in its interior. Yeah? If you have equality, then you see you have a zero in the denominator. Then the pressure at the origin would become infinite. And if you violate this equation, if it even goes in the other direction, then you get in an interior region where the pressure is negative, which is unphysical. So a stable star exists only at 9, 8 times Schwarzschild radius. And we have derived this for incompressible stars. It also holds for more general um, uh, perfect fluids. Actually, Buchdahl proved it under the assumption that the density is monotonic, that it increases from the, from the boundary to the center, which is a very natural assumption and more general than what we did. Yeah? But uh, so for this very general assumption, this Buchdahl limit holds. So you see there are many interesting radii in the Schwarzschild space time. Rs itself, of course, that's the horizon. That's the most important thing. Then we had three times Rs. This was the so-called ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit. Then we had three half RS. This was a photon circle, where a photon stays on a circular path. And then we have nine eighths of RS. This is the Buchta limit. So there are a couple of interesting radii where, where interesting things happen. So this was actually, well, one, one purpose of this lecture today was to demonstrate to you how the field equation with matter is to be solved. And the second, uh, quite interesting result is that uh, I wanted to derive this Buchta limit, which is important to know. It plays an, plays an important role in the theory of, of stable stars, in particular of very compact stars. So this is not so unrealistic for very dense objects, neutron stars or things like that. It's, of course, totally unrealistic for ordinary stars like our sun. But for neutron stars and things like that, 
it, it, becomes, it becomes relevant. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about Schwarzschild. Sorry for running five minutes over time. And tomorrow we talk about gravitational waves.